what the ITTF tests for. Hi, according to technical leaflet T3, veer is a measure of the sphericity of a ball, or to put in layman's terms, how round it is. It's measured by rolling the ball down a slight incline onto a table that is 100 centimetres long. The incline is 100 millimetres long and at a 14 degree angle to the table. The rolling surface has to be at least 20 millimetres thick and have a certain roughness. Each ball is measured three times and a fail occurs if the ball hits one of the two side lines which run parallel to the centre line at a distance of 175 millimetres to the left and 175 millimetres to the right. A negative result occurs if the ball fails the test twice. How our tests were done. In our veer tests we used Jeweler SC3000 tables with the centre line acting as the guideline. I've made my own incline after some pine spatia groove wood which I glued onto another piece of wood which I cut to an angle of 14 degrees. The green ink you can see represents a 100 millimetre length the ball needs to be rolled down the incline. I also cut two 100 centimetre lengths of dowling and marked them at 25, 50 and 100 centimetre intervals. These lengths of wood were then placed 175 millimetres parallel to either side of the centre line on the table. One camera was mounted eye up, side onto the table to measure where, if at all, a ball failed the test by hitting the lengths of dowling. A second camera was placed low down directly behind the incline to show the ball being rolled onto the table and subsequently how much it varied from the centre line. Each ball was rolled three times down the incline. Once with the seam of the ball lined up with the centre line on the table, once with the seam approximately 90 degrees to the table and once with the seam at an angle of approximately 45 degrees to the table. Again, a number of caveats need to be considered. Firstly, the table's roughness may impact on the way these balls roll. Secondly, if the table isn't flat, and the far end of the table wasn't, which is why I switched the foaming of this test round to this side of the table, the table will corrupt the results. Thirdly, if I've not lined up the incline correctly, the results will be skewed as the ball will be sent off at an angle to the centre line. This was one of the reasons I chose to place a camera directly behind the incline, so you can judge for yourself how straight the feed is. Fourthly, the balls were released by hand, so how I released the ball could impact the direction the ball travelled in. However, to compensate for this, I used groove wood for the incline which acted like a rail track, ensuring the ball travelled in a straight line onto the table and crucially, the point at which the ball left the incline and made contact with the table should be a smooth transition. If the base of the incline wasn't flat to the point of release, the ball could bounce onto the table, affecting the direction the ball travelled in. Our results. Out of a total of 27 times these nine Jeweler Super 40 celluloid balls were tested, a ball veered to the left six times, rolled down the centre line nine times, and veered to the right 12 times. But not once did a celluloid ball fail this test. Out of a total of 72 times these plastic balls were tested, a ball veered to the left 12 times, rolled down the centre 18 times and veered to the right 42 times, of which 9 were fails. Of those 9 fails, 5 balls failed once and 2 balls twice. So 2 out of the 24 plastic balls we tested would have returned what the ITTF call a negative result, and that is right on the allowable limit. In addition, all four boxes had at least one ball that failed the beer test. So it's not like that there was a rolled box which skewed the test results. Our conclusions. Jeweler's celluloid balls rolled to the left 22.23%, to the right 44.4% and down the centre 33.3% of the time. By comparison, Jeweler's plastic ball rolled to the left 16.67%, to the right 58.33%, and down the centre 25% of the time. So there was a similarity in the dispersion of the test results, although a greater percentage of the balls from the celluloid boxes did roll down the centre. In addition, after 27 times that the celluloid balls were rolled down the via test, not one of the balls failed. Whereas Jula's plastic balls failed 9 times, or 12.5% of the time. 
If the table was a deciding factor in these results, at least three of the celluloid balls should have also have failed. But they didn't. So there is some evidence at least to suggest that Julia's celluloid ball is rounder than the plastic one. And this suggestion becomes stronger when you consider this next footage. Here I'm rolling a plastic ball into my drop bottle. The logic behind this test is explained in our video Bounce and Conformity. The first time the ball falls through the hole I've cut into the bottle, which is what it should do. But when I repeated this test with the same ball, but rolled it into the bottle along a different axis point, it gets stuck. Now the hole in this bottle isn't perfectly round, and the diameter of the plastic ball is allowed to vary by up to 0.6mm, so there can be variation in the size of the plastic ball. But if a ball falls through the hole once and it's perfectly round, it should in theory fall through every time, and they didn't. Out of 72 times I rolled 24 different plastic yes. balls into this bottle, that's three times for each ball rolled along the seam, horizontal Random. and randomly, two balls got stuck on each occasion. Across the seam. Random. Five balls got stuck Across twice. The Across the seam. Random. Nine balls got stuck once. Across the seam. Random. And eight balls didn't get stuck at all. Across the seam. Random. And that suggests that these Jula plastic balls are not as round as they could be. And that's something that we come back to in our video size and conformity. However, although a couple of these balls did fail the test, there's no denying the fact that the Jula Super P 40 plus plastic ball passed T3's via test results for us, as did the celluloid ball. Thank you for watching.